How's it going everybody? My name is Philip and today we are back with some geography now. Today we're going to be reacting to Mongolia. Uh, recently, somewhat recently, within the slap, within the time that I've done YouTube, my, my, what, year about or so, I've reacted to some uh, music and one of the music, one of the musician groups, one of the artists that I've uh, reacted to is The Who from Mongolia. And, uh, I know absolutely nothing about Mongolia. Actually, no. There was, okay. One thing, it's a little tidbit. I don't think it was, I don't know if it was Mongolia, but okay. In Uncharted 2 or 3, the video game Uncharted, they mentioned something about like a green lion or green tiger or something like that. And I remember, I, I then, because I remember... I listened to the song, right? And then I went back and I started playing over the Uncharted series because I got the Nathan Drake collection at the time. And all of a sudden, I was in like some monastery or some whatever. I don't know where I was, but in the game, obviously. And one of the puzzles had to do with a green tiger type of thing. Something similar like that. I was like, holy crap. <laughs> holy crap. Anyways, I just thought that was something that's kind of cool. Anyways, but that's about it on that, I guess. So I've also noticed that I don't do a lot more, a lot of geography stuff recently. And I want to get back into doing more geography stuff. Because that's, I, I want to start expanding my mind and learning more about other countries and whatnot. So, starting up again with Mongolia. So here we go. Now, you guys know I'm half Korean. If you don't know much about East Asia, basically, putting aside all the political differences, at the end of the day, the nearly 2 billion of East Asians, like Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese, are distant cousins. Then, little Mongolia comes in with less than 3 million people, and they step on the scene, and it's like, oh, hey, hey, Grandpa. Hmm. It's time to learn okay. geography now! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbs. You may have heard a little bit about this guy, mostly through the massive empire from Genghis Khan, or Genghis Khan. But Mongolia is unique in that it's kind of like the kindred root that billions of people stem from all over the world. And it all starts on some grassy hills that we will locate in... Mongolia is... Before we fully get into it, the only thing that I remember about Mongolia... I actually don't know if this is true. I, I think I always Okay, what else what I'll say? Mulan, I don't fully remember if that was Mongolia, the the bad the bad guys. I don't know if that was Mongolia, but I think I kind of just as I learned geography and whatnot, I think I after learning about Genghis Khan, I kind of figured the bad guys were about Mongolia. Okay, that that's that's kind of what I've always thought, and I've never fully corrected myself. So I'm hoping to be corrected today, or to be proven right. Either way, I'm here to learn. Known as the land of the eternal blue sky, as they get over 250 sunny days a year. They really Damn. are kind of like the center of Asia. Even though technically the actual geographic center of Asia is claimed by three spots, two in Russia, one in China. But Mongolia is really <laughs> close to all three of them. Anyway, Mongolia is a landlocked country, the 18th largest in the world, located in center East Asia, bordered by Russia and China. If it wasn't for this very narrow 23 mile long corridor, they would also touch Kazakhstan, but they don't. The country is divided hmm. into 21 provinces, or Aymag, with the capital Ulaanbaatar, meaning Red Hero in the northeast, acting cool. as its own municipality with provincial status. Literally all roads in the country eventually lead up to this one city, one way or another. Oh, and it has this really cool looking curved sky tower building. Fun that fact, Ulaanbaatar, cool. spelled a variety of different ways depending on how you look at it, is the world's coldest capital and it was actually a nomadic city that moved 28 times before settling in its current location. The city in itself holds hmm. about 45% of the entire country's population and holds the only international airport, Genghis Khan. International and a new airport is being okay. built on the other side of the mountain so far just called new Ulaanbaatar International It has okay. That's kind of interesting. Why would you build it? I understand it's But why not further in different areas of the country? 
has almost nothing <coughs> around it, so good luck. Otherwise, the second and third largest cities are Erdenet and Darhan, located relatively close to Ulaanbaatar. Wait, do now, those is kind of also have because airports? Although they don't have territorial disputes, they do have some interesting border demarcations, such as the narrow western slot of Lake Buir, shared with China. Russia gets a small slice of Ulf's Lake. On the east, you can find a tripoint monument for China, Russia, and Mongolia at Tarbaganda, and plans for a possible western tripoint marker on the peak of Mount Tavambogdo Ula are on the way. The country has a main railway that transects the north to south, entering both Russia and China. This also connects to the larger well-known Trans-Siberian Railway in Russia. More lines are planned to be built in the future, but for now, almost the entire western part of Mongolia is only accessible by crude roads and paths or, you know, horse trail. Yeah, we'll get into the horse thing later. Anyway, now when I say Mongolia, obviously I'm referring to what constitutes the boundaries of modern day state Mongolia. Keep in mind though, historically, the regions of what are now Inner Mongolia that belong to China or the People's Republic of China were part of the larger Mongolia region and today has more ethnic Mongols than actual Mongolia. Coming to Mongolia, you'll probably be hit with a lot of interesting sites, especially with Genghis Khan. You know him, he's everywhere. <laughs> Statues, buildings, carvings on hillsides. The airport is actually named after him. He's even on their money. Some Notable sites of interest might include places like all these museums, the Bod Palace, Ich Berhant Complex, the Yo, Taihar Stone, the Shambhala Stupa Structure. The locals kind of consider it like the center of energy for the universe. Of course, there are so many mm. hundreds of different monasteries cool. like these, including the oldest one, Erdenezu. And of course, there's the Pride and Glory statue, the Sonjin Bulldog Genghis Khan statue. Yo, the... okay, so I think I saw one of the, the Who videos where at the end, I think they might have been standing in front of that. Or they were standing in front of like some monument or some statue or something like that. They were standing in front of something, and it, it just uh, that's what it reminds me of. Anyways, it's still kind of cool. The thing Mongolia is probably known most for is not the handmade landmarks, but rather the vast open expanses of grassland where all the power began. Which brings us to. Remember that universal wallpaper for all windows monitors back in like 1997? It had that serene rolling green hill. That's kind of what comes to mind yep. when I think of Mongolia's landscape. Fun fact, it got converted into a vineyard. Anyway, Mongolia lies on the center of Asia, sandwiched between the Gobi Desert in the south, and there are three main small mountain chains. The Altai in the west, where you can find the tallest peak, Hutian, on the border with China. The Hangai Mountains in the north, where you can find the deepest freshwater lake, Hovsgol. However, the hypersaline lake, Uvs, has more surface area. In between these two mountain chains lies the Valley of Lakes, where most of Mongolia's natural lakes lie. And finally, the Hentil in the north, which is where the longest river, the Orhon, flows, sourced by Lake Baikal in the Buryat Republic of Russia. Basically, if you want the overall summary, the south is a dry, cold desert, the north is greener and hillier with grassy hills and water, and the entire <laughs> country is subjugated to the massive atmospheric pressure zone known as the Siberian Anticyclone. This is a huge, cold, dry air mass with massive pressure that accumulates between September and April, usually centered around Lake Baikal, and it grows as far as Italy in the west and Malaysia to the south. In a nutshell, this is what keeps Mongolia generally windier and chillier, even though they get lots of sunshine with little snow. Basically, it's a very dry landmass, and the rainiest spots only get about 14 inches of rain a year at best. Damn. Weird, right? Dry but cold. In fact, the only natural disaster that they face would be the Zud, or a harsh climactic condition that causes massive amounts of livestock to die off due to freezing conditions and starvation. Jeez. Also keep in mind, the Gobi Desert is the source of the eastern winds that causes all the dust storms that fly all the way across Eastern Asia. In the Korea episode, I explained this. It's called Hwangsa. All right, this is my uh, triple shot of espresso break. Usually Noah comes in, but his car broke down, so he can't make it here. Ken, just, just, just take over. Just take over. I'm out. Okay. Mongolia is known for being very big and empty, which makes it perfect for animals to graze. In terms of wildlife, Mongolia is a horse haven. They're often seen as the national animal. There's even a wind horse in their emblem. And that just like we discussed dope. in other Central Asian country videos, the horse has played such a huge role in Mongolian history from transport, riding, food, milk, and sport. It is estimated that about 13 times more horses and 30 times more sheep live in the country than actual people. In fact, Mongolia is the home of the last truly wild horses in the world known as Taki. The horses have have 66 cool. chromosomes, two more than your average horse. Otherwise, the famous two hump Bactrian camel are also Whoa. national treasures. They even Whoa, have a festival the devoted to them. Other species like the Saiga antelope and their weird noses roam around the grassland, and about one third of the Oop. world's snow leopard population lives in Mongolia. But Ken, what about their economy? Don't they have like a bunch of minerals or something? Yes, they do. Mongolia focuses on two main industries, herding and mining. Minerals make up about 80% of their exports, mostly in gold and copper. However, both sectors have been in decline 
declined for the past decades in favor of service jobs. Mongolia is also the second largest producer of cashmere goat wool in the world after China. They have the second largest population of yaks, again, after China, which they use for milk and dairy. Speaking of which, food. First of yeah. all, no. Mongolian food. beef barbecue is a Chinese invention. It is what? not authentic Mongolian food. You have authentic dishes like aru, which is dehydrated curdled milk cheese. You have the national Yo, drink, No, 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 wait, 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 we ain't, we ain't, we ain't, we ain't skipping. We're looking at all the food. Dishes like aru, which is... Yo, this looks kind of good. I want to try, like, I want to try these. <laughs> Dried cheese is what he said. Is that what he said? It's dehydrated curdled milk cheese. Dehydrated. Okay, interesting. I still want to try it. You have the national drink, Irag, which is a fermented milk often from horses. Ba Horse milk? What? I mean, I've had goat milk before, so I mean, I'm willing to try milk as long as it's not from male horses that you thought was milk, but it's not actually milk, if you know what I mean. <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is that one video of the dude is like, goat milk is very, gr it's very weird tasting. It takes forever to, to, to get out. I, I, I'm going to have to try and find it. But he's basically talking about he was jerking male goats off and thought that, that was milk. And he was drinking uh, sheep no. meat called horhog bodog, which is this inside out cooked meat thing. And finally, booze dumplings. Yeah, Yo. a lot of meat and dairy. It's just part of their culture. And speaking of culture, I'm gonna try all that. I'm totally you fine with that. You sound that. really enthusiastic when you do these things. You you like doing this, don't you? I am enthusiastic. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, get back to the camera. Okay. <laughs> now, growing up with Korean culture, I was always kind of under the influence that Mongolians are kind of like the mystical ancestors of all East Asians, and there's kind of a tincture of truth to that. First of all, the country has about 3.1 million people and is the most sparsely populated sovereign state in the world with only about two people per square kilometer. The vast majority yeah. of the country, at about 95%, identify as Mongolian or one of the main Mongolian people groups like the Buryats or Dorbod, and so on, whereas the remaining 5% come from a variety of minorities, mostly Kazakhs and Russians. They use the okay. Mongolian Togrog as their currency, they use the type C and E plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. Now, what does it mean to be Mongolian in the Yo, 21st I love their century? Flag, though. Well, for one, the language. Mongolian is a unique tongue spoken with some interesting galatal stop sounds, strangely enough, kind of similar to the ones that you find in the Inuit areas of the Arctic. Here's a clip from Easy Languages. I love these guys. They do such great street interviews. Check them out. <laughs> Улаанбаатар хот маань ер нь 360 жилийн төвхтэй манай одоо хамгийн сайхан хот юм нэг. And keep in mind there isn't just one type of Mongolian but rather a few distinct cousin groups like the Altai, the Buryats, the Kalmyks, mostly found in modern day Russia or the Inner Mongolian regions of China. Each has a distinct dialect and tradition. Some speak completely unintelligible Turkic based languages, but overall they're all cousins. Geography Ongor said, if you locked a Mongolian, Buryat, Kalmyk, Inner Mongolian and a Tuvan in a room, it would look kind of like this. <laughs> What are your hobbies, Kalmykia? I like to drawing pictures. What about you, Tuva? Uh, me like having this for... Yeah, Tuva would probably have a little more trouble communicating, but they're all definitely family. Now, the interesting thing is that although Mongolia has always kind of been like a lightly populated nation, it's always been the genetic source for billions of people. How did this happen? Well, in a nutshell, the Mongolian Empire, you may have heard of it. Although anthropologists have been able to trace <laughs> East Asian know, ancestry originally through the human migration patterns that passed through India and the Middle East, the Mongolian invasions of the 13th century greatly shifted the genetic structure for what would become billions of people. Geneticists have been able to trace the Y chromosome common pro Jenner in at least 17 million people alone that are directly descended from Genghis Khan. Damn. And that's just one Mongolian. Pretty interesting. Otherwise, in terms of faith, <laughs> a little over half the population adheres Damn. to Buddhism, introduced shortly after the Mongolian Empire collapsed during the Yuan Dynasty in China in the late 13th century. About a third are either traditional shaman or non-religious, and the remainder are mostly Christian or Muslim, especially the Kazakh people being Muslim. Mongolia today writes mostly in the Cyrillic alphabet. They adopted it in the 1940s during Soviet times. However, prior to that, they actually had their own writing 
writing system known as Hudum Mongol. That looks so cheek. cool. It was written vertically left to right, inspired off the old Uyghur writing system. It almost went out of use, but today it has been reintroduced in schools and is trying to revive itself. Today That's you can see it cool. on road signs and even in Inner Mongolia, they use it as a script as well. Culture wise, there are too many things to list, but one thing you need to understand is that to this day, like many other Central Asian peoples, about a third of the entire country is still nomadic or semi nomadic, choosing to live in yurt communities, housing okay. made up of traditional circular living structures that can easily Those be broken cool, apart though. and transported. They are huge on wrestling or boh. They even have the world's largest wrestling event in the July game event known as Nadam with over 6,000 competitors, no weight class, Damn. and it gets intense. The traditional style comes in many different forms, but essentially the men wear briefs, boots, and a zodog or bare chested jacket. As the legend goes, there was one occasion in which a woman beat all the wrestlers, ripping her jacket in the process, exposing her breasts. And since then, all the jackets were made to expose the chest of the wrestlers to make sure none of them were women. Otherwise, <laughs> horse fighting and archery are huge. Traditional Mongolian dance comes in a variety of styles, many inspired by the movements of animals like the falcon dance or the prancing lion dance. Another huge deal would be the traditional throat singing. I have been yeah. waiting so the long who? to cover this because it is so cool. Basically, if you've never heard it, it's essentially a singing style called overtone singing, which is done with two tones at once with the mouth, the regular voice, and the second one with an almost eerie sound sounding whistle. For example, this is so cool how you how they do that. How do they do that? It's like Otherwise, Mongolia is huge on festivals. They have them throughout the entire year. Things like Sagan Sar, Mongolian New Year, with lots of fatty meat served. Ooh. They have the Ice Festival, the Golden Eagle Festival, and so on. Okay, time to move on. History, in the quickest way I can put it. Proto-Mongolic Khanates. Mongolian tribes unify under Genghis Khan Damn. and the Mongolian Empire. That's Mongolian massive. Empire split up into four separate Khanates. China starts coming in. Mongolians convert to Buddhism, some to Islam. Also during this period, the Kalmyks moved to Kalmykia, which is now part of Western Russia. Nearly two centuries of rule under the Qing Dynasty. A lot of political marriages between Mongols and Manchus. Late 19th century Han Chinese immigrants move into Inner and Outer Mongolia. 1911, Mongolia declares independence. Shortly after World War I, Mongolia decides to side with Russia and remove Chinese occupation. 1932, Monk Rebellion, Stalin's Purge. They act as like a buffer for Russia and China during Sino-Soviet split. <laughs> 1991, Mongolia becomes a democratic country. New buildings and pop okay. culture comes in. And here we are today. Some notable people of Mongolian descent or from Mongolia might include Modu Chanyu, Tan Shi Huai, Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan, obviously, <laughs> the various Khans that followed after him, Sorgak Tani Beki, the fourth Dalai Lama, Vachi oh. and this poet guy, <laughs> Yangat, D. Dagba Dorj, Natsak Dorj, Jugvarshin, the cosmonaut this guy. Yeah, a Mongolian person went up to space. And speaking of the grand scope of the world. Now, Mongolia did have the second largest empire throughout all of history, right after the British. So they've always kind of had a way of dealing with a lot of people across the world, I guess you could say. Outside of Asia, Germany and the USA have close ties. They're one oh. of the few countries that had consulates in the early 20th century. They have the okay. largest communities of Mongolians abroad in diaspora. They are also countries where Mongolians prefer to work and travel to. Really? About 2% of the population can speak German today. And many are learning English as well. Mongolia kind of has dope. a little bit of a crush on South Korea and Japan. Pop culture. <laughs> dramas are super popular tons of koreans and japanese okay i mean but like let's be real how could you not have kind of a crush on south korea and japan like <laughs> they're just yeah. restaurants are everywhere and the two are super comfortable when they meet each other many mongolians also have taken part in sumo wrestling including this guy who became yokozuna kazakhstan and turkey are kind of like the newer but technically old friends as they see mongolia as kind of like an ancestor to their people both have great interest and respect whenever the word mongolia is brought up in terms of their best friends however many mongolians might say russia because they didn't want china to overtake them although mongolia never became a <laughs> soviet republic they did kind of act as like a buffer zone between the two countries, especially during the Sino-Soviet split. To this day, many Mongolians even speak Russian. Russians come in all the time. And the two nations have just been generally very close, especially during the turn of the 20th century. In conclusion, okay. with Mongolia, you have a very vast open space inhabited by few people, but these people hold a very important secret that Asia could not live without. Stay tuned. Montenegro is coming up next. Huh. Okay. That's a, that was actually really kind of cool. I mean, I would have I would would love to dive into more Mongolian history, if I'm going to be completely honest. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. It's pretty dope. <laughs> um, I don't know a whole hell of a lot of, like I said, Mongolian history. Um, 
I always have a hard time when it comes to uh, comes to the not necessarily just media, but it's 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 like movies and shows and whatnot. Like obviously on Netflix, and I don't know how historically accurate this was, or if it's just completely fiction. But the Marco Polo uh, show that they had how many years back? I don't know if it's still available on Netflix. I really enjoyed it. Um, but Marco Polo, I, I think it had something to do with Mongolia or, or Genghis Khan or something like that. I don't know. I think it had something to do. Anyways, again, I don't know much about Marco Polo actually as well. And I, and I, and I have a hard time saying what I do know because of all I know is from the show. <laughs> so, I mean, I know he was what? Not an adventurer. I don't know why I always want to say adventurer, but like an explorer kind of type of thing. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's basically it. <laughs> There's a lot that I need to learn. Okay. So I'm, I'm down for this. Originally, this was why I, I made this channel because I love, well, I more so really enjoy learning things and figuring what's up, you know, now more so I'm, I'm more open to expanding my mind now in my later years <laughs> thank, you, thank you guys so much for watching though uh, let me know what else i should react to in the comment section below and where can i get some of that dehydrated milk thing as well if, if i can order it or if i could find it somewhere around here that would be dope i want to try it i don't know why i just i, I want to try it i don't know what dehydrated cheat milk thing is milk uh, cheese thing yeah also i don't know if horse milk is good or not i feel like it's kind of weird but i mean if they drink it i'm willing to try it so i guess right just don't tell me i feel like if you tell me though it's gonna make me kind of be give the ick so don't tell me at first and then tell me after so i can say oh it's actually really good I hate that you didn't tell me first, but I mean, it's, yeah, anyways. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Subscribe for more content just like this and more reactions on geography and history and other things like this. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Let me know what else I should react to in the comment section below. What should be the next country that I do? Uh, there are some in Africa, and that was quite a while ago, and I forgot, and I just chose Mongolia because of the who, and I like their music. So I'll see you guys next time.